Welcome to the Friday Happy Hour with Victory Strategist, award-winning author and your happy hour host, Anne-Marie Kelly. Each week, Anne-Marie chats with women who have reinvented, started over or wrote fabulous next chapters. They share how they overcame their midlife challenges and how you can too. So kick back with some good happy hour something to drink and enjoy today's show. And welcome. You're listening to the Friday Happy Hour with me and Marie Kelly. I'm that recovering good girl and your victorious woman empowerment partner. And this is where us victory chicks, you guys who care about us, meet on Fridays to chat about things we can do to make our lives better and more fulfilling and give us a little more jazz and sparkle. Thanks for coming to Happy Hour this Friday. We're doing something slightly different today. I invited Shaman Anamani to join us. Anamani grew up as Eileen Santos, and a few years ago she made a transition and started her next chapter. She has an interesting story, and the slightly different part is that she's going to demonstrate something she calls a soul reading. Now, I have to tell you, I'm a little nervous about it, but it'll be interesting. So I want to tell you about this cool thing I did this week, but before I do, I I want I wanted to talk about two other things. First, I don't know if you heard or watched any of the rally with the young people from the school in Florida. Gee, squeeze, what an articulate group of kids. And they are kids, 15, 16, 17 years old. And to speak out so soon after what happened, still mourning the 17 dead classmates. You know, it was something, a heartbreaking something. And the debate about gun control rages on. Some was about mental illness, too. But I only heard one person talk about behaviors in the home and at school. I didn't hear any talk about the social media factor or the impact of violent video games normalizing violence. I I don't know, maybe next week. But also on TV this week, the Olympics. How about our women's Olympic hockey team? How exciting was that game? Now, if you missed it, they went into sudden death overtime, and then they nailed it. Those women were so excited. It was a second miracle on ice. You know, imagine that historic men's hockey team victory. Then last night, I watched some of the women's figure skating, and I saw some beautiful skates and some devastating ones. You can understand why Olympian and announcer Tara Lipinski called it a six-minute lottery. Because I think you never know. You prep, you prep, you prep, and then you're on, and then whatever happens, happens. The pressure must be terrible. And those skaters are so young. I love the skill the skaters demonstrate, and I appreciate the Lutzes and the Sal Cows. And I love those finishes with them spinning around on one leg, holding up one uh, one leg up in the air. I can't even do that not on the ice, but they do it on skates and make it beautiful. But I think the thing I like best is looking at their outfits. You with me on this? You see some of those and think, wow, I'd love someone to turn that costume into a cocktail dress. And in my size. You know what I mean? All that glitter and sparkle and the distinctive designs. Would a dress like that be fun, like any one of those. Of course, those young ladies don't have an ounce of fat on their bodies. But, you know, most of them don't have any curves either. They're mostly straight up and down. You know, but they're really young. <laughs> Still, I think, so, and, you know, and I know you guys like the, like some curves, I know. Still, I think some cool designer would have a whole line of figure skate. Would have, it could be fun to have a whole line of figure skating modeled cocktail dresses. But that wasn't my most exciting thing this week. Someone gave Joseph tickets to see Billy Joel at Madison Square Garden in New York. 
The only glitch was that it was on Wednesday. And it's, you know, it's hard to get away like that in the middle of the week for either one of us. Probably for you, too. But free tickets to Billy Joel? How could he say no? And then he invited me to go with him, so how lucky am I? And it was a whirlwind 24 hours. Joseph, so it was on Wednesday, and Joseph and I both worked that day until 1 o'clock. And then I met him in King of Prussia, and we drove to the Hamilton, New Jersey train station, where we missed the train by literally one minute. The train was still on the track, but the doors had closed, and then it was gone, and we had to wait 45 minutes for the next one. We got to New York just after 4, checked into our hotel on 35th Street, and then we practically ran up to 46th Street, where, which is, you know, it's, that's the restaurant row, where we were meeting friends at Joe Allen's restaurant. After that whirlwind afternoon, I can tell you that I totally welcomed the Scotch Rocks I had when we first got there. Dinner wasn't pricey. We just had hamburgers. And they, were, and they were served by this very cute, aspiring actor. And, I, and we, like we know, someday he'll be a star, and we'll say, he served us hamburgers at Joe Allen's. Well, when we were done, we had plenty of time to walk the, it, to the garden. But one of the friends that we were meeting had, was having shoe issues, so instead of walking, we took a cab. I'm reasonably sure that with all the traffic backups and lights, it took just as long to get there by cab as it would have taken if we would have walked. That's just like such a crazy thing to me. But the con- but here's what I learned about the concert. Billy Joel has been playing Madison Square Garden every month. And if I understood him correctly, it was the 45th month in a row. His 90th performance at the Garden, 45th doing it like this way. Well, he kept saying, wow, this is a great job. Well, yeah, it must be a great job. Yeah, you, you decide you're going to do what you love to do best, and thousands of people come to see you. And then you have fun, and they have fun. And you know what? I checked, and Madison Square Garden seats almost 21,000 people for a concert. And this concert was sold out. And I'll bet the other ones are sold out, too. Can you imagine doing a sold-out show for 21,000 people every, every month for a couple years? Now, what a rush that has to be. And they're all there to see you and all the hard work you put in all those years, and now you just kind of get to ha- have fun with it. It's neat. And we had great seats. They were in the side bleachers, but towards the front. It's, I, you know, maybe in the, I don't know, eighth or tenth row or something like that. And that, that, that's my favorite thing. I love being on the side because I hate being on the floor at the concert because people are standing, are all standing up. And if you don't want to stand, all you get to see are people's butts. I remember one time we stayed, we stayed, my brother, it was, I was with my brother and we had stayed, uh, we camped out overnight and to get tickets. And I was so excited to get tickets on the floor and then I never saw the concert. Everybody's standing on chairs. That's not what I want to do. I like the, I like the, I, I like being in the, in the bleachers, and that you know, and that was the case here. The seats were in a good spot. I got to see everything without being crushed. It was it was great. Billy Joel started a few minutes late, like everybody does at concerts, but he was on stage from about eight ten until almost eleven o'clock. And I have to say, I saw Billy Joel in concert during the Christie Brinkley days. Probably in 85 or 86. And I remember that because she was there. And that was the Innocent Man Tour. I don't know if you remember that album, but that, that and The Stranger are my two favorites. I, and, you know, but seeing him like 30 some years ago, I have to say, I think he was at least as good on Wednesday as he was back then. Yeah, and you know what? Maybe he was even better. Because he talked to the audience and he played with us. I remember we went to see the Bacon Brothers at Longwood Gardens. And, you know, I could have put in a, a CD because they didn't interact with the audience. Not Billy Joel. He, he did that and, and then he would say, well, I can do this song or that one. 
four or five times he gave the audience a choice, and then the crowd would let him know which of those he wanted to hear. And he did all this good stuff, Italian Restaurant, Vienna Waits for You, Allentown, New York State of Mine, and, of course, Only the Good Die Young. And that was what I remember my girlfriends and I singing. You know, that, you remember the words that you Catholic girls start much too late, and we were all Catholic girls. So, you know, we, we would be singing that out loud after we had a few. And you know how it is. Songs are the playlist of your life. You hear a certain song that brings back an event in your life or an old flame. Sometimes you hear the song that makes you happy or nostalgic, and sometimes it put, pulls on your heartstrings in a sad way. But that's the miracle of music. Well, if you want to take a look, I post a Wednesday set list on today's radio wrap-up at victoriouswoman.com. What, but you know what they did? And, and I know it's on his set list, but it was new to me. One of his bandmates, Michael Del Giudice, I think I'm saying that right, sang Nessum Dorma. Now, I don't know what Puccini was thinking when he put those notes together, but there's something so special about them. And, it, and they, the, you know, there's, the notes make up for some of the dopey words of the song. Although I only know them in English. Maybe they're better in Italian. But who'd have thunk you'd hear amazing opera at a Billy Joel concert? And, and I posted that on today's radio wrap, along with a performance on the opposite end of the spectrum. Billy Joel's roadie chainsaw sang Highway to Heaven. And he just really whipped up the crowd. You can find a lot of the Billy Joel concert on YouTube, but I especially wanted to share those two uh, Billy Joel highlights with you. And, of course, one of the best parts was uh, watching him do Piano Man. And people, as they showed people in the audience, and they were all singing like crazy people. It was just fun to watch. And listen, here's something else I want to share with you. Our guest today, Eileen and Omani Santos. She's an award-winning and international best-selling author of Unmasking Your Soul, A Transformational Journey of Truth, Light, and Healing. Listen, if you have some crazy idea for a next chapter and you don't think you can make it happen, you've got to hear her story. So go get some good happy hour something to drink and come back with me and Shaman Anomani. You're listening to the Friday Happy Hour. Remember when you wished you had more time for yourself? And now you have it, but you notice you're keeping busy with stuff, but that stuff isn't making you feel happy or filled up. And when you think about what would make you happy and filled up, you get stuck or feel overwhelmed. And then you go back to what's more familiar, more comfortable, even if it's not making you happy. Wouldn't you love to find a way to start making sense of that deep discontent you're feeling? Well, you're not alone. I'm Anne Marie Kelly, author, victory strategist, and the radio show host of the Friday Happy Hour. And I know there's a place for you, one that other women have found to be both inspirational and empowering, and it's the Victorious Woman Project. Go there now and get on my mailing list, where you'll be the first to know about my upcoming online workshops, teleseminars, and more. And while you're there, take a couple minutes to look over my blog You can download some of the free stuff I have for you and let it get your creative juices going. I'm looking forward to meeting you at the Victorious Woman Project. And that's at www.victoriouswoman.com. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour. I'm Anne Marie Kelly, and I'm here with Shaman Anumani. Welcome, Anumani. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm glad you could be here with us today. Um, we have a mutual friend in Teresa Hummel Crowlinger, and she introduced me to you because she thought you had a good next chapter story. <laughs> well, you know what? Last night I was watching the Olympics, and uh, it, you got on my mind during one of the commercials because the commercial said the tagline was, Start Your Impossible. And it made me think of you because you're already doing your impossible. Like, who would think? I, so, I, and I want I want you to help my listeners understand what you mean. What I mean, um, you started your life out as Eileen Santos, right? Yes. So, in your personal life, like, tell us a little bit. Are you are you married? Do you have children, grandchildren? Where where did you grow up? I grew up in Morristown, New Jersey, in Northern Jersey, and I spent most of my life there. I am uh, single now. I was married for some time. It's part of my story. Uh, But uh, I've been single ever since my divorce. And um, do you want me to get into the story of... If you want to, yeah, you can. 
Yeah, it was, um, I think as a child, I was very connected uh, spiritually and I would have these flying dreams and um, one day I said to a cousin of mine that I had had an odd out of body experience and he said, you're crazy. And I think at that point I shut myself down. Mm, that has, that happens to a lot of people. I think, yeah, it's a common story. I hear people a lot say, I don't have anybody to talk to this about or, or, you know, this is crazy or what's my family going to think. And so I pretty much was asleep for most of my life when I disconnected myself. I became, my career began as an electrical engineer because I was talking to my brother's friend and he said, you know, you're good in science. Maybe you should try engineering. And I did. I became an electrical engineer and then I, I worked as an engineer for a couple of years and decided that I really wanted to get my MBA because I realized I liked more of the business side. And I went to Columbia University in New York, and I got my MBA. And I worked in New York City for over 12 years as a consultant. I first started with Philip Morris doing some internal efficiency work and then went into consulting and worked with companies like Accenture and IBM and then a small consulting firm. And in 2003, I had this dream that changed my life. And my body was already starting to break down. So this is one of the things I would tell your audience to pay attention to. I was having a lot of migraines and fainting spells and I had gone to doctors and they couldn't find anything. And they were saying that it was probably just stress. And I think a lot of it was because I was working long hours. Uh, If anybody knows about consulting, I mean, I was working sometimes 14 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And my body was really breaking down. I had become a workaholic because I was ignoring all the things that were happening inside of me that I didn't want to look at. Hmm. So when I talk about wearing masks, that's part of what I'm speaking about is that there was a part of me that was yearning to come out. There was a part of me that was dormant, wanting to express through me. But there was a part of me that was scared of letting that part of me come through. And Ronnie, I hear that from so many women, you know, one or both of those sides. So that's, I, I think that's really common. It is common. We're socialized to do that too. It is. Um, I think we're, that's part of the, one of the masks that I wore. I call it, uh, you know, the, the mask of uh, people pleasing and that I thought that in order to gain people's love that i needed to do the things they were telling me to do and I was searching for love outside of me so when I had the dream of awakening uh, the most potent part of the dream was a voice I heard at the end that said my child I have a mission for you you're not going to understand what it is but be patient because in time it will all be revealed And for me, it was God's voice, but whatever it is that you believe in, you can replace that with source, creator, higher power. And I, the dream was so lucid that I remember every detail even today, and it was back in 2003. And the first thing I did was leave my unhealthy marriage. I knew that that was part of what I needed to change. And then I started to meet people because the minute we say so let me just stop you yeah so up until then you had like this what we would call a normal life you had like a good job <laughs> yes. you had a regular marriage you know all that all that stuff was going on then you had this dream and and it's what i said at the beginning it's like if you know sometimes you get these crazy ideas and then you keep pushing them back because you think well i can't do that yeah but you couldn't you didn't resist that well there was a lot of resistance you re- along you the way. It, you resisted I, I didn't resist the, the dream because by that point, like I knew when I woke up from that dream, I was in so much pain inside. Mm-hmm. You know, part of being a workaholic was me ignoring what was happening at home, that it wasn't a healthy marriage. We had tried therapy. It wasn't working for us. And the dream gave me the courage to do what I needed to do, which was leave the unhealthy marriage. I don't think I would have had the courage if I hadn't had a dream. But I tell people that part of what I teach people is to begin to connect more deeply with the part of you that's beyond this human body so that you can trust what 
you're feeling inside of you. And at that moment, I trusted that what that dream brought for me was courage. I like to call it the spiritual warrior. It's one of my paintings. And that was one of the gifts that came through as I started to really trust the journey and Mm -hmm. really surrender to the journey, which is so hard for us as human beings to trust and surrender. And people started to show up in my life. So is is that what you mean when you call, when you talk about unmasking the soul? When I talk about unmasking a soul, it's taking off the masks that you're wearing that aren't allowing the real you to be expressed. And so when people talk about being authentic, being the real you, that's really what I'm helping people do is Mm -hmm. help discover, you know, what's really inside of you? What's your purpose? Why are you really here? And then help remove what's in the way of that. And part of what's in the way are the masks that we wear because we pretend to be somebody else. And many times, because there's there's fear underneath that. There's fear of of really showing people who we are. Or maybe, like you said, we've been conditioned Mm. that we think a woman needs to behave a certain way or that you need to do something a certain way. Uh, I grew up in a Hispanic household, so part of what I believed was that, you know, I need to get married and have children. And so that conditioning then begins to affect uh, how you behave in the world and also what you allow people to see in you. And for me, uh, and I've seen this with many other people, we will tend to wear masks based on the conditioning that we have in our subconscious. That's interesting. Yeah. And so so one of the things that you talk about or how you talk about the your physical being and your spiritual self has to be given a voice. And is that is that what happens when you unmask? Yes, the the voice really is the 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 soul part of you. So I'll just define what I mean by soul for people. It's really the spirit part of you, the soul is the part of you that's more expansive than this human body. Uh, And if you think about intuition, and and women tend to say women's intuition, but everyone has intuition, the soul communicates to you through your intuition. It could be something simple, like the phone is ringing, and you kind of know, like, you think you know who's calling, Mm -hmm. right? That's a part of your intuition. You say, I've done that. I'll bet that's, for no good reason, just say, I'll bet that's, and then it is. Yes. Or you're walking down the street and a stranger says something to you that is the answer to the question that you've had, right? That's how your soul communicates with you in different ways and through your intuition and through other people. And we need to just start paying attention to that. And so I started to pay attention and I started to surrender I met people. So so when you say that, that you started to surrender, what does that mean? It means that that I started to practice uh, connecting with that soul part of me. One of the ways I do that is through meditation, right, going into the stillness. And I would get guidance, like, you know, you need to take this class, or somebody, I would meet somebody, and I happened to meet an energy healer. Back then, I didn't even know what that was. Um, some people may have heard about Reiki. That's very common now. That's a type of energy healing. They do it at massage places now. I didn't know any of that, and I started just listening and paying attention to what felt right. So when I say surrender, it's doing the things that are beginning to feel right in your heart, like your heart already knows and doing it even though if you don't know why, right? And I, surrendering means you're not questioning what you're feeling and, and what you feel you need to do and just taking the steps. And then the small steps become bigger steps. Mm. Uh, and through people that I met, I actually didn't know what my purpose was. So in the dream, I wasn't told, like, hey, you're supposed to be a shaman. And I was told there's a mission for you. And that was part of the discovery process, that as I took steps and started to meet people, I started to do more spiritual practice, connecting and meditation. I discovered that I could easily connect with the spiritual realm. You know, some might think of that as your guides, you know, angels. But but did you, 
had you done that prior to, like in all those years that you were an engineer and working for companies, had you even considered any of that? No. I was always very, uh, I would say, spiritual. Uh, I was raised Catholic. Uh, my mom taught us to always, you know, be loving and helping people. And, and from her, we learned how to do that. That was one of my greatest gifts, I think, was in always wanting to help people. So I had the foundation of it, but I didn't know what energy healing was. I hadn't really read any books on what spirituality was. In fact, my my husband at the time was much more spiritual than I was when we were married. Interesting. Yeah. And Amani, we need to take a break. And then when we come back, I want to talk about chambers and soul readings and... And you're going to give me a soul reading so that our listeners can hear what it is that we're talking about. So everybody hang, hang with us. And we'll be back in just a minute. You're listening to the Friday Happy Hour. Hi, this is Anne Marie Kelly, author, victory strategist, and the radio show host of the Friday Happy Hour. I trust you're enjoying my conversation with this fabulous, victorious woman. If you're getting inspired with ideas and feeling empowered, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's more for you. Tips, downloads, resources at the Victorious Woman Project. Go to victoriouswoman.com and look around and get on my mailing list so you can be the first to know about the newest good things I have for you. That's www.victoriouswoman.com. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour. I'm Anne Marie Kelly, and I'm here with Shaman Anumani. And uh, Anamani, you were talking about, you talk about 12 soul chambers, and you refer to them as puzzle pieces. But during the break, you were talking about how you break them down. Yes, yeah, so the in my book, Unmasking Your Soul, there's really three stages of the journey. And it's really the three stages that I was taken through. The first stage is called truth, and that's really where the unmasking begins to happen. And really the main question, there's four chambers, I call them soul chambers, that we begin to unmask. And what we're unmasking are the places where you aren't loving yourself. There's different virtues that I'm helping you with, like how to love yourself more, how to feel more worthy, how to feel more powerful. All the things that, you know, society tries to uh, teach women not to do Hmm. and we tend to be givers and so we give 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 to others but but forget to love ourselves and so in that first stage part of what I'm helping you understand is why are you really here and then what might be in the way of that and consistently I found with people that I've worked with that there's always something around being able to love yourself more deeply knowing that you're worthy of doing the work that you want to do and that was actually one of the big ones for me when I had that dream I said God why did you choose me I did not feel worthy of doing the work that you know was coming afterwards you know the being an artist and an author and and a shaman and so I had to work through the many layers of things that were in my subconscious many from you know my childhood uh, and then a lot of experiences from my adulthood and then in stage two we move into what I call light and light is where you start to connect more deeply with the part of you that I called soul you start to connect with your intuition more deeply with your own wisdom so that you are taking inspired steps And that means that you're not just taking action, you're taking action that's inspired by spirit, that's inspired by why you're here and what you're really here to do. And in the last stage, it's called healing, and that's really where you are really allowing your soul to be the one that's guiding the journey versus your ego mind. And we haven't talked too much about that, but we all know what the ego mind is. It's the... You know, some people call it the ego, uh, ego personality. Some people call it shadow, the shadow sides or the inner critics. Those are the parts of your subconscious that have been conditioned in a certain way. 
and they sound like voices and they say, no, you can't do that, or no, who do you think you are, right? And those are the parts of our, of our mind, of our subconscious that we work through as well to be able to really live our purpose because the mind starts to get in the way. And, you know, even after years, I've been on this journey since 2003, I practice meditation every day. I still have the voices coming in, you know, uh, telling me things like, oh, you can't do that. But I'm at a different place now where I recognize that it's my ego personality. And you can tell them to go away. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I've built a, you know, different relationship and I have tools to work with them. So that's part of what I help people with as well. So in, this, in one stage of the, of the work that you do, you do these things called soul readings. Yes. And you're going to do one of those with me. But what is a soul reading? I was talking to somebody... I was saying earlier, I was talking to somebody about this, and she said, I'd never heard about that. And I thought, you know, I've never, except because I, I, of Teresa, I never heard of it either. So explain what that is. Sure, a soul reading. So I think of myself as a bridge to your soul. And shamans really are the bridges between the what most would call like the physical plane and the spiritual plane so one of the things i discovered that i could do was actually be a bridge to your soul so that i could tell you through my paintings and so over the years since i had my dream in 2003 i've painted 22 different paintings i didn't know at the beginning that they had these universal soul messages it was you know after some time that i discovered that so each painting has a message that when the person picks that painting i know you know sometimes they'll pick the healer painting it's called my journey in puzzle pieces so your soul is then telling me, like, tell this person if they don't know that they're a healer, right? Or that they're meant to be a leader, right? So each painting has a specific message that kind of creates this story that your soul wants you to know about where you're going or where it's taking you and what energetically might be in the way of that. So there's some paintings that show me like, oh, this person has some inner childhood issues, so you need to help them with that. That's what's in the way of them stepping in more deeply mm-hmm. to who they are. So when you came to the station today, Anamani, you gave me, and I didn't even, I didn't even <laughs> ask you how I was supposed to do it. You gave me a, a stack of your cards that, of the paintings you've done. Yeah. And I like zipped through them and picked out the ones that I really liked. So I picked out, I ended up picking out four. You said people pick out any, different numbers. Yes, Usually my instruction is pick nine or less. <laughs> of course I didn't pick. I didn't even ask. So <laughs> no, it's it's quite all right. Um, you picked what you were supposed to pick, and that's what I always find with people. So you picked four because that's what you were called to pick. And I'm just going to go through uh, the paintings here and tell the story of what you know your soul. And we're going to do an abbreviated version because usually you know this could take you know like 20 minutes. So the first painting that you picked is called Amazing Grace, and I'll just describe it for people. It's my hand coming out of the water, grabbing on to a cross, and it's inspired by the song Amazing Grace. I was once lost, but now I am found. And it's a painting of transformation, and it's the important energy around this particular painting is that your soul is asking you to surrender more deeply. And normally when we're moving into a different part of our journey, it's like we have to grieve the old parts of us that we need to let go of. So part of the energy of this painting is grieving what you need to shed because it's not serving you anymore so that you can step into a new part of yourself that's ready to express through you. So it's a big painting of transformation. And then subsequently you picked the phoenix rising which is shows a woman and if you know anything about the phoenix it burns in the ashes and then ri- a new phoenix rises from the ashes and this painting has a woman rising from the ashes with the phoenix behind it and it's also a painting of transformation it's like a rebirthing if you think of the resurrection of you know Christ where a part died and then a part birthed again it's the same concept 
it's you're going your soul is saying it's taking you through a process where you're shedding some old parts of you so some new parts of you that want to express through you have the space to do that and it requires a lot of surrender and it also takes you to a new place of following more of your passions passions that are in your heart and many times it's about um you know discovering more gifts or a deeper expression of your gifts that now have the space to come through you and then you picked archangel michael and archangel michael always shows up so this painting actually is a a painting of archangel michael and he shows up to let you know that you're safe that you're protected and that part of the shedding process requires us to face some of our inner fears so it's about that inner contemplation of going in and facing the fears and shedding that and letting you know that you're going to be safe as you do that and then you got a beautiful painting here which is one of my favorites listen to the voice of your angels which is about that deeper connection with the angelic world it can mean a prayer and communion in the stillness but it always means a deeper understanding of why you're here and your mission work and it's like we go through these stages of dropping more mass going deeper and understanding more of why we're here and it's kind of like a cumulative effect and that's really what my book does as well it's you kind of unmasking these different layers you understand a part of your purpose and then later on you get more of that so for you that's a beautiful you know journey that your soul is taking you on saying it's a time of transformation for you and asking you to surrender to that you know that surrender thing is always i think for most people that's the hardest thing because we always want to think that we're in control of something yes so how do you get past that well you have to practice it and <laughs> and and you also have to get sometimes you got to get help i resisted a lot in my journey um but i met an amazing community of people especially when i started writing my book uh, like the community that you've built around this radio show right we we sometimes need that help and that encouragement there were times where i wanted to give up because it just felt too hard mm-hmm. and people would say to me like no you're needed in the world and and i would sit with that and i would feel all that love and i think i mentioned to you when we were talking i call it being loved back into being and i believe that we all need that we need a sisterhood a community that loves us back into being in those moments when we're being asked to surrender and we're scared and it's hard mm. for us to do it alone mm-hmm. but then when you you have those other people with you it's much easier to surrender and and as women we do that really well yes we do um and amani we need to take another break so we're going to so we're going to be doing that uh, everybody stick with us we'll be right back you're listening to the friday happy hour Are you one of those women who lived the first part of your life as a really good girl? That is, you did all the right things and followed all the so-called rules for women. I was like that too. But have you noticed that once you passed 40, you have less patience for those rules? Maybe you even think that the rules really don't make sense for you anymore. Maybe they never did and you just didn't realize it. Do you want to go where other recovering good girls meet to inspire each other and support their new empowered selves? Then join me, Anne-Marie Kelly, and some very fabulous Victorious Women. We're on Facebook at the Victorious Woman Project. So go to facebook.com forward slash Victorious Woman Project. I'll talk to you there. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour. I'm Anne-Marie Kelly. I'm here with Shaban Anumani, and we just had a soul reading. And that was interesting, Anumani. It was different. It was... uh, and you know, and my listeners know, I have a new book that's launching next week. So, so when you're talking about the transformation, I'm like, yes, that's what I've been planning for. <laughs> so, one of the things that that you talk about when you, and, and this I hear this from so many women when they're starting that next chapter, they're making a change or they're reinventing their life or or like they're leaving a marriage after a long time or they're empty nesters or something you know happens they they lose their job. 
So many women can understand the feelings that you had at, at that time, and they were all the not enoughs, not good enough, not smart enough, not capable enough, not worthy enough. That stuff's ingrained in our psyche. What do we do about that? Yeah, we have to start to unravel that. And, uh, and part of the way I started to do it was through journaling, and I would write down, you know, the beliefs that were coming up because I call them, you know, the ego person, in, the ego personalities in my book. Some people call those inner critics. And so something that you need to start to be aware of is that there is a part of you, the part that I call so that uh, some people call it the inner wise self or the higher self that is very loving. And when it speaks to you, that voice is always going to help you feel nourished and loved. However, your ego personalities are going to usually come from a place of fear. And so you can start to pay attention and ask yourself the question, where is this coming from? Is this a place of fear? And if it is a place of fear, because normally that's what's underneath feeling unworthy and all these other things that you mentioned, then where did it start? And you start to um, change those limiting beliefs because they really are limiting beliefs. For me, some of those came from my childhood, things that have been said to me, experiences I had. And I started to pay attention, like, how does this feel when I'm hearing that voice, right? telling me, well, you can't do that. Like, who do you think you are? I knew that wasn't coming from a place of love, right? And that's the difference. Is it coming from a place of love or is it coming from a place of fear? And if it's coming from a place of fear, then it's some sort of conditioning that you have in your subconscious. And the subconscious runs 95% of our lives. Mm -hmm. You have to start to then take back power and control from those ego personalities. And you start that by working on um, limiting beliefs and journaling and getting help, like the kind of help that I do with people. You know, I do uh, the shaman work that I do is energy healing, and I use my voice to do that. But getting help to help you break down those subconscious beliefs. I have to tell you that one of the things that that idea of taking back your power is a big thing, and 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 the book that's launching next week is called The Five Year Marriage, and I see it as a book of women's empowerment. And people say, "Well, how could that be?" And and it made me, it makes me always makes me think of Maya Angelou, who she had a thing she used to talk about. It was called bite, blow, bite, blow. And I, I don't know if you if you know what I'm talking about, but she said, it's it's like some what happens is that I think and I can't remember what the animal that she referenced, but uh, it's in West Africa, and they they blow on they blow on something to sort of anesthetize it, then they take a bite, and then they blow so so that you don't feel the pain so much. Mm-hmm. And I think so many times in a, in for our personal power. Somebody makes us feel good, feels good, feel good, and then they tell us, like, well, who do you think you are? But then they say something nice at the end. So so you almost, it's like a little zinger in between something. And so it's like blow, bite, blow. So it's like a nice conversation, nice conversation, zinger, nice conversation. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and and you're mentioning a good point that when somebody says something to you and it's a zinger, because we're mirrors for each other, that's an opportunity. I call them triggers. Uh, when you get triggered like that, that means there's something that you need to heal within you. Really the parts of you that need to be loved back into being. And those parts that come out as fearful, they're really trying to protect you. They don't know any better. They're only basing it on past experience. And that's why they're telling you, oh, don't do that. Remember what happened last time, right? So you have to be able to start unraveling that and begin to shift that part of your subconscious uh, to shift the limiting beliefs so that you can step into it. And you take baby steps, right? We're, that's what I did. I didn't, you know, it's taken me, what, 15 years to get to where I am. I've done a lot of work on it, but initially I was taking baby steps because otherwise it's overwhelming and then you become When you paralyzed. say baby steps, what were some of the baby steps that you took? 
Um, well, I took a big step by leaving my unhealthy marriage, but then baby steps, I meant like I was still working in corporate, right? And so my baby steps were like taking a meditation class. I had never done that before. Another baby step was reading a book. So a friend of mine, when she knew what I was going through, she said, you need to read Marianne Williamson's A Return to Love. That was the first book that I read when I was going through this, and it opened me up to a whole new world. And that's exactly what my journey's been about, returning to love. And ultimately, for all of us, that's what it's about. It's returning to that place of love. And the parts of us that don't feel loved, we're helping them feel loved again by doing the work, right, the spiritual practice. And, you know, I've had coaches and I have healers work on me and doing the work to help me really embrace who I really am and to feel good about all that. One of the things that you talk about, Anamani, is building your truth muscle. And uh, is that really possible? Anything is possible. (laughs) Yes. And you're living proof, right? (laughs) Yes. Uh, So building your truth muscle is part of the, that's the last chamber in the first stage. It's about divine truth and really understanding why you're here. And what I mean by, you know, building your truth muscle, uh, I mean it in a couple of different ways because part of it is coming through your your own willingness and ability to speak your truth out, right? Because that, that was something that you said and that, that up until you made this trans- transition, and I have a quote here. You said, I couldn't always say what I wanted for fear of creating conflict or that I wouldn't be accepted. Yes. And so... You have to practice it, and you and I tell people, you know, practice with the small things first of, let's say, for me, a lot of it was relationship with family and with, with my husband at the time. And so when I was going to publish, I was published in an anthology in 2015 before my book was published, and there were some things in my story. It was short. It was a five-page story, but there were things in my story that my family didn't know about me. And I had to tell them before it was published. And so I started to have the conversations. And that's what I mean. You start practicing to speak your truth in little moments. And in, and in safe spaces. And in safe spaces. Because the more you do that, the more you're training yourself and you're retraining your subconscious. Like, hey, it's okay to do this. But you have to do it in a gentle way. Right, and you have to feel um, safe to be able to speak your truth. And so, the more you practice that, the easier it gets. And there's there's something that energetically starts to happen to your body. You're, you you begin to open your heart more, and when you begin to open your heart more, you're actually attracting more of that into your life, which helps you feel even safer. So there's this accumulation effect that happens as you take those baby steps, as you begin speaking your truth, you will feel more encouraged and safer to keep doing it until, you know, eventually you get to a place where you say, well, I don't really care about what anybody else thinks because it feels right to me. In the four agreements, um, they talked about not taking things personally, and that's really where I had to get to. Hmm. I had to get to that place where... If it was me and I felt I needed to say it in a certain way, I would always try to say it from a place of love, but really not worrying anymore about what people would say. Even, you know, that I'm a shaman, that was a struggle for me. I was in corporate world, and and then I had this secret life of all the spiritual work that I was doing that I felt I couldn't tell people. And now I tell anybody who wants to hear about it because it's who I am. It's part of who I am. And it's so much easier actually to be yourself than to not be yourself. I, that's, I think that that's true. It's, yeah, and it's hard. I can't even imagine what it would be like if I was in a relationship and living with somebody where I didn't feel like I could be who I really was all the time. Like I, I, on the outside, maybe not all the time, but at least in your home life. And, I, and so many women tell me that they don't feel like who they really are. Uh, we, 
This went fast. <laughs> uh, you have a special offer for my listeners. I do. So it's a $47 special offer, and I call it a soul discovery session. And it's a 30-minute session, and everyone gets a soul reading as part of that. And we actually go into uh, what might be holding you back from living your purpose, from who you really are meant to be. And then you're actually going to experience me working as a shaman on you and doing some of the energetic work to help release whatever is ready to go. Well, for anybody who's interested in having a soul reading, and you had a little taste of it with that with Anamani doing that with me, um, that you can take advantage of that special offer. The link to that offer, there she has a web page for it, and if you go to the radio wrap up at victoriouswoman.com, then you can see it for t- the, the link is right there. There's more information about Anamani and the link to the forty-seven dollar special offer. Thanks for coming today. Thank you for having me. So, Victory Chicks and you guys, what did you think of that soul reading? Interesting, huh? I hope you've got something interesting to do this weekend. Uh, Tonight, Joseph and I are meeting friends, and she is the widow of Joseph's best friend, Dan, who was best man at our first wedding. And she's been dating a really nice guy, his name's Steve, so for, for a couple of years now. And we get together from time to time, so that we're doing that tonight. The rest of my weekend is work. Next week is the official launch of the five-year marriage, so I'm doing the launch at my office in Wayne. Um, you know, I'm excited because people who are coming are uh, friends who have been hearing about the five-year marriage for years and years and years. And so many of them, I'm happy to say, love the idea and can't wait to read the book. So I'm getting ready for that tomorrow. And, you know, it's that dreaded tax season, so Joseph and I are getting ready to, for that, too. Hateful stuff. I can't wait until we can do our taxes on a postcard, if that ever happens. And also, you know, I, you know what I'm doing Sunday? My publisher friend, Donna Cavanaugh, you, you probably remember Donna. She's the publisher who, who writes funny books, also. She's having a book signing for one of her authors at the Narberth Bookstore. Uh, the book is by Perry Block. It's called Formerly... Nouveau Old, formerly cute. Perry Block is a baby boomer and he who suddenly realized he's at the age where he had previous, previously been, the age that had previously been reserved for people's parents. And now suddenly he's it. I'll bet you can identify with that. Since uh, I'm sleeping with one of those guys myself, you know, Joseph's getting in the big 6'5", I'm going to the Norberth Bookstore on Sunday. It's from 2 to 4, so if you want to Take, come and take a, a look at what this Perry Block guy has. I think you'll think it's fun. I have a good soul quote for you to take through this week. It's from the amazing Judy Garland, who said, For it was not into my ear you whispered, but into my heart. It was not my lips you kissed, but my soul. So I hope this week someone or something whispers into your heart and your soul gets kissed. Thanks for joining me today at the Friday Happy Hour. I'll be back next Friday. I hope you'll be here, too. Chen San. Thanks for listening to this Friday Happy Hour. Make sure you subscribe, rate and review today's show. And join us again next week for the Friday Happy Hour with Anne-Marie Kelly.